Good morning, folks. It is so good to see each and every one of you. As we get started here this morning, uh, it is the first Sunday of June, and so we have some of our first of the month things we got going on, which first up is birthdays. And there should definitely be some of you standing because I think June, you know, those of you who actually filled out your little yellow paper for me a few months ago and I got birthdays recorded, June is like tied for the most birthdays in a month. So if you have a June birthday, would you please stand? Okay, I was going to say, if I have to, I'll pull up the list and start calling you out. <laughs> and then um, we also have an anniversary today. Happy anniversary to Jared Nicole. But let's go ahead and sing happy birthday to all of our June birthdays. Because his hour had not yet come. 
But many of the crowd believed in him. And they were saying, when the Christ comes, he will not perform more signs than those which this man has, will he? The Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about him. And the chief priests and the Pharisees sent officers to seize him. Therefore Jesus said, for a little while longer I am with you. Then I go to him who sent me. You will seek me and will not find me. And where I am, you cannot come. The Jews then said to one another, Where does this man intend to go that we will not find him? He is not intended to go to the dispersion among the Greeks and teach the Greeks, is he? What is this statement that he said, You will seek me and will not find me, and where I am, you cannot come? Now on the last day, the great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone's thirsty, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture said, from the, his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke of the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. For the Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. Some of the people, therefore, when they heard these words, were saying, This certainly is the prophet. Others were saying, This is the Christ. Still others were saying, Surely the Christ is not going to come from Galilee, is he? Has not the scripture said that Christ comes from the descendants of David and from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So a division occurred in the crowd because of him. Some of them wanted to seize him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Nicodemus, he who came to him before being one of them, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what, is he, what he is doing, does it? They answered him, You are not also from Galilee, are you? Search and see that no prophet arises out of Galilee. Everyone went to his home. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you this morning, Lord, I thank you for your precious truth. Father, I pray that we, as your children, would seek to cherish it. Father, seek to know it and read it and study it and then obey it and apply it to our lives. Father, I pray that here today, Lord, you would bless our services. Father, from our worship of your majestic and holy name to our fellowship, to the preaching of your word. May Jesus Christ be glorified. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. This time, let's go ahead and remain standing. Let's sing and worship our great God. Let's sing, Faith is the Victory. It comes among the hills of light. In Christian soldiers rise. And press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies. Against the fall in vast below, let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory.
feeling like what you want, you're going to get. Faith is believing what God has said. Okay, let's sing Amazing Grace. July 9th, Day at the Lake, will hosted by the Hefners. Uh, pray for a nice day. We've had some, and uh, the, 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 the lake's ready. Uh, we're, we're ready to receive you, and we hope we have a good turnout there. VBS coming up, like I said, right after Turtle Days. Um, be praying for that also. And then August 7th, we will have our baptism. How many folks we got signed up so far? Two definite. So if you want to be baptized, see Pastor, get on that list. And we'll take care of it. I think that is everything. Is there something I may have missed or something we need to add? All right. Thank you. All right. Let's stand again and sing. All praise to him who reigns above. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> Blessed be the name, blessed be the name, blessed be the name. 
song that I'm going to sing you this morning, and it's one that we may be trying to teach in the congregation, so I get to demo it for you, but from the first time I heard this song, it's the words of it, I challenge you just to listen to it, it's, it's a precious thought. I often talk about when you see certain words in Scripture, especially when you see those, what we call possessive pronouns, you know, the fact that Jesus sees us as His. He is my Savior. Uh, that ought to be a precious truth to us. Amen? Amen. Chapter 16, we're going to be reading verses 1 through 4. 
We started into this last week. Starting in verse 1, Paul writes, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I directed the churches of Galatia, so do you also. On the first day of every week, let each one of you put aside and save, as he may prosper. Let no collections be made when I come. And when I arrive, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. And if it is fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, as we come before you now, Lord, we thank you for your precious word. Father, I pray that this morning, Lord, that we would have open hearts to you, to your Holy Spirit. Father, as we see these challenges and, and even encouragements that Paul is giving here in your word, may we take them to heart and apply them in our own life so that we might honor and glorify you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. As Paul gets to chapter 16 here in Corinthians, we said that he's making a radical change from doctrinal to practical stuff. He's been discussing the resurrection all throughout chapter 15 and, and trying to put probably a, a, one of the most important doctrinal proofs out there to these Corinthians that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead and we will be too. And he's been building this all up. Chapter 15, he, he's dealing with a lot of heavy doctrine. And then he gets to chapter 16. He's like, I'm going to give you some party work. Some encouragement. These are some things that you should be doing. Now the first one that he comes to is giving. <laughs> it's not the topic that many of us like to talk about. Why? Even as believers, money is a sensitive topic to some. To most, actually, I would say. But yet, in giving them to the Lord, there truly is great joy. And, and I say that from the perspective, not so much that uh, give me, give me, give me all your money. Give your heart to Jesus Christ. That's what he wants. That's the all he wants in our giving. He didn't ask you to write a check and empty your bank account. He says, give me your heart. Because if I have your heart, it's all I need. I'll take care of the rest. You know, in dealing with bad theology, bad practices, Paul wants to leave them with some encouragement. And in this first topic, one of the reasons it's uncomfortable is because in some of the experiences that I've walked through, you know, I don't know how much is, I'm not going into the detail here this morning, but most of you probably are aware of what happened this past month. There's a church in Warsaw. It was devastating. They found out their pastor was involved with some great sin in his past. That's devastating to hear about. And, and even though I really don't know anything about that church, my heart breaks. Why? Because the devil's going to use this as an opportunity to attack the name of Jesus Christ. Now, I'm talking about giving. While I've never, by God's grace, and I pray, never, never do, be present in a church where there's a situation with great immorality. Unfortunately, I've been in part of a church where the pastor stole a great deal of money. And I remember how much it devastated the church. And so when talking to you about money, I, I kind of cringe a little bit because I pray that God continues to protect me, Lord, that he would give me a humble heart that would also keep me from falling into some of these sins. Because I'll tell you what, I'm just as human as any other individual sitting here in this room, as anyone out in this world. I'm only one choice away, one sin away from absolutely ruining my life or ruining my family's life or even potentially being used to harm and destroy this church. And, and so, in thinking about that, because I have been around some very bad situations involving church and money, it, it's a little uncomfortable because we always want to rush to the money side of it. But folks, do we trust the Lord? Yes or no? We're to trust in the Lord with what? Our whole heart. I guarantee you. You know, we look. I don't know. I had it playing during the, the promo slide before the service started. We had um, our neighbor here so graciously got out his drone for us and did a little video of the guys working. They were putting the roof on Wednesday. And uh, they're almost done. They'll, they'll probably be back tomorrow. If it takes them more than one day, I can't see it taking them more than two. 
I mean, I'm no roofer, I don't know what's on the wall, but you probably noticed the cardboard and the front side of the church is all done. The Lord's blessed us. And, and that is a blessing that we're able to get that done. And prayerfully, at least for all of the adults here, you will never have to worry about a church pro or a roof problem in this church here. <laughs> Lord willing. But God's provided. He always has. And it hasn't been contingent upon whether every single one of us gave. But there is principles in our giving, and it's not just our money, but I want to plead and urge you to seek to honor God with your giving, everything. Your money, your time, your whole heart. Seek to honor Him with it, and I guarantee you He will bless you beyond measure. Now when Paul began talking about this, he talked about the purpose of giving. The purpose of giving is to accomplish the Lord's work. It's meeting the needs of others. And the way that that transition, especially in the Old Testament, was giving to the local church and having the local church use the money that comes in to take care of both the property that they have, the way the Levites were providing for, but it's also to be meeting spiritual needs as well as physical. And we are blessed. We have some tremendous missionaries. I, I love it when our, our ladies get up here and, and whether it's they send me a video to play that's got a link so we can see and maybe hear our missionaries or when they're just sharing What's going on? I think that's wonderful. We have some brothers and sisters in Christ that we have the privilege to partner with. And when we give here, our church gives that money to some of those missionaries. We give a, a significant portion where they go out and they're reaching people for the gospel. They're seeing people grow in Christ. And we get to play a part in that in just a small portion of what we're giving. But we should be giving far more than our money to those missionaries. We ought to be bathing them in prayer. Amen? So the purpose of giving is to fulfill the ministry of the church. Secondly, though, Paul gives some principles there in verse 2. And we started looking at the first three last week. Paul talks about, uh, and, and it's alliterated, hopefully that helps take the mind, but the period is the time frame. And even though Paul uses the phrase each week, he's not suggesting that you, if you're not putting an offering envelope in the, in, the, in the plate every Sunday that, oh, you're not giving enough. I understand. Some of you may be in, in retired state, you know, you get your, your pension or your social security check, whatever, once a month. So you cut it all at once. I'm not saying that's wrong, that you have to take that and spread it out and give a small portion every week so that you're giving every week. It's the idea that we're supposed to be giving continually. Why? Because it's a part of our worship. Everything we have, all of that money, we all, we received it because the Lord gave us strength to either earn it or manage it well, correct? So we're giving back to Him what He's already given us. And the crazy thing is, the more we give to God, it seems like the more He keeps giving back to us in return. If it's coming from here. If you're doing it out of obligation, no, that's not what He wants. He says, give each week from this, from your heart. He talked about the participants, and he uses the phrase there in verse 2, each one of you. There's not a single person that should be included. Now, you might say, well, wait, Pastor. Or, or maybe, you know, we've got some, some younger people here this morning. You say, well, wait a minute. Pastor Joe, I don't have a job. So I, I don't have money coming in on a regular basis. Okay. When you do get money, do you set aside a portion of it? And maybe you don't have a lot to give. Maybe, maybe it matches. Maybe some of you kids can only afford maybe to put a quarter or even a dime in, in the offering. But you know what? If you're truly giving that to the Lord because he let you have it, and it's like, you know what? I want to give this back to Jesus. He blesses. So incredible. <clears throat> and the amount doesn't matter. And the best, one of the best examples we find in Scripture is the, the example that Jesus was watching that widow who just put in her two copper coins that were a penny. It's not the amount. It's the heart. It's giving he wants each of us to be giving from his heart. And the place, Paul is instructing them, because this is the development of the early church. It's like you give through the church. The church is the means now that helps spread out that money you're giving and using it for God's glory. Now this week, we come up on the difficult one. The proportion. How much should we give? Well, I want you to look back at verse 2 there. Right in the middle of the verse, we can see all these principles. On the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save. But I want you to notice that phrase, as 
he may prosper. Some versions say, even as God hath prospered you. Is there anyone in this room who would be foolish enough, that's your warning, so don't raise your hand, but is there anyone foolish enough in this room to raise your hand and say, God has not blessed me? Thank you for not raising your hands. God has blessed us beyond measure. And when we give to him, that's how we prosper, because he in turn blesses us. And Paul's entertainment here, his challenge, is completely discretionary. For a Christian to give as he may prosper. And there's much difference of opinion when it comes to how much should we give, how much of our income should be given. We use the words tithe and offering frequently when it involves our money and giving to the church. Okay? If I were going to stop here, and I don't want to go into this too deep, but if I want to break it down, some people automatically want to say, well, tithing means that you have to give your 10%. I can sit here and I can spend time with you if you want. I can tell you from Scripture where there's nowhere where that's prescribed in New Testament giving. You say, wait a minute. Right? So you're saying I don't have to give 10% and I can just, I'll, I'll put a dollar in every week and I'll be blessed, right? No. I think tithing and even having 10% as a figure is a good goal. So here's where I'm going to try and encourage you a little bit. Hey, if you think and you want to say, well, we all are supposed to give because that's what the Bible says. We're all supposed to give our 10%. I can take you through the Old Testament. I can show you passages that, that show if you really want to go to Jewish law, they didn't give 10%. They gave more like 23%. Because the first 10% was given as the first fruits to God, and that was kind of the inheritance for the tribe of Levi. Because if you know you're anything about the land, when the portions of the land were being divided out to the 12 tribes of Israel, God didn't give um, every tribe a portion of the land. Levi didn't get a portion of the land. Say, well, that's not fair. God had a higher calling for them. He chose Levi to serve as the priestly tribe. And so that first 10% that came in, that was actually the way of the other tribes giving unto the tribe of Levi to help them meet their needs. They were the ones going to God on behalf of the rest of the nation of Israel, offering sacrifices. So the way that the other tribes helped support them was by giving. That's what we could call our tithe today. Our tithing for the church, a percentage that we give unto the Lord, is what helps pay the bills around here. Offering, though, is something different. Offering is something above and beyond. See, on top of that 10% that they gave to take care of the, the, the house of God and the tribe of Levi, they would give another 10% that helped cover the cost of all the feasts, um, uh, meeting other needs that the nation of Israel had. So we're up to 20%. But then God even says in, Levit or in Numbers, every third year, you need to give an extra 10% every third year because that's going to meet the needs of all the widows and the poor. So I don't know about you, but I look at it from a budgetary purpose. If I know that I can plan ahead because I know I'm going to have a big bill, I should think to myself, well, if every third year i got to come up with an extra 10%, why don't I just set aside a third of that in the first year and another third in the second year, and that way it will be the same in the third year, and then I add it all together and I've got my 10% to give. Okay? So from that perspective, they were giving 23 and a third percent. I don't know about you, but the temptation I heard the first time I heard that presented, I began thinking of my paycheck and thinking, yeah, I'm looking at the gross. And then I look at what taxes take out. And then I'm going to take out another 23% off of that. I don't have, I'm lucky if I have half my paycheck then. By then. And we look at the numbers, we get so fixated on it. God's not prescribing that for us. You know what he says in the New Testament? Give cheerfully. Give from your heart. That's what Jesus said. You know what's incredible? The story in, in uh, Exodus where Moses was collecting money because they were going to build this tabernacle. And man, it was ornate. I mean, lots of the things were, was very good, high quality wood that was then taken, dipped in gold several times. But you know what the Lord said? It wasn't, every one of you are all commanded, I command you to give a portion back to me. You know what he said? Give as your heart leads you. Give it from your heart. And you know what happened? 
That was like in chapter, I believe it was in chapter 25. And by chapter 36, Moses had to go back to the people and said, stop, you've given too much, we don't need it anymore. You know why? Because people love the Lord and they wanted to give to him their best. And it got to a point where it's like, we, we got more than we need, you don't have to give any more to this. I, I can give you example after example after example of how that's happened in churches all throughout church history. Because people gave, and it wasn't anything about the amount. They gave from their heart. Giving's a part of worship. Now that being said, you say, okay, well then, how do we know what to give? Well, I think 10% is a good practice. Even though it may not necessarily be specifically stated that we're supposed to give our 10%, I think it's an excellent practice. Now, some of you might be looking at your checkbooks and mentally thinking, it's like, you know, Pastor Joe, I, I can't afford to give 10% right now. Okay. Maybe we set a goal. Maybe we look at it and say, you know what? Maybe by the end of this year, I can rearrange my finances in such a way where I can start for it to be a 10% by the end of this year. Maybe not by the end of this year, maybe two or three years down the road, I can have it. Why? Because it's a goal. And it's not so much that I'm doing it because oh, I've got to do this, it's like i got to give to the church. Or, no. I want to be in a position where I can give to God. And then, quite frankly, and I know that this has to be true in the hearts of, of some people, they get to a point where they've reached that goal of 10%, and then they start thinking, it's like, what else can I give Because he's allowed me to get to this point where now I'm giving him my 10%, but man, he started blessing me in some other ways. Now, now I have all this extra. Or what else can I do for you? But that comes from a heart that says, Lord, I want to give you I know you'll meet my needs. That doesn't mean that you're foolish, that you go out and just say, okay, empty the bank account and give it to the church. Okay, God, please bless me. No. God didn't cause to be foolish. He just wants your heart. It's all he's ever wanted. Crazy thing is, if we want to expound on that, Paul said in 2 Corinthians 9, 6, He who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully shall also reap bountifully. The benefits of a willful, cheerful giving unto the Lord produces both spiritual and material blessing. And you know what's even crazier? Just two verses later in that same chapter, Paul says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, that having all sufficiency in everything, you may have an abundance for every good deed. Let me clarify. As far as tithing is concerned, I don't know what you give. Don't want to know. But I do know what Scripture says about giving that portion that first comes in to help meet the needs of this church. Malachi 3.10, and I quoted it last week and I've quoted it several times. That's the promise. That's the challenge that God says. I dare you to take me up on this. And not because he's challenging us in a confronted way. He's like, I dare you because I want you to take up the dare so that you will see how great I am and how much I can bless you. And prove me now here with, if I won't open the windows of heaven so much and pour you out a blessing that you won't have room enough to receive it. And, and he's talking there though because in the, in the previous verses, He's actually chewing the people of Israel because they were failing to give just to meet the basic needs of the tribe of Levi. If God wants to bless us that much and just giving for the basic things, how much more do you think he'll bless us when we're able to give even more? You've heard the phrase, he owns the cattle for thousand years. He's got everything. But he's not going to just bless us and give us everything if we're not seeking to follow him and obey him. And I'm not going to tell you that you're wrong. One of the reasons why I try to stay as far away from the offering envelopes and the giving as much as possible is I don't want to know. You know why? There's, there's one thing and there's one job in this church that I despise. It's those who have to count the offering. And the reason being 
is because they see who gives what. And I guarantee you, there are many times the devil wants to work on them and say, oh, look, that family doesn't give as much as this one does, or, or these people don't give as much as you do. Don't think for one second that the devil doesn't try to attack those individuals who do that and serve in that capacity in your church. For that matter, even without worrying about who those individuals are, pray for whoever has to do that job each week, that God will protect them, and then we'll take all the faithful gifts that come in and bless beyond measure. Amen? I want to urge you to consider setting a percentage. I would even further challenge you to set a goal. If you're not there yet, have a goal to try and give 10%, but don't look at the number figure as though once you get to that 10%, then it's okay, then I'm, I'm doing good, I'm okay with God. No, 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 no. More than anything, have that as a goal so that you can be a part of giving unto the Lord here, but do it because you love the Lord and you want to be blessed by Him. And I'm only stressing this out, and I'm only urging this partly because it's coming from our text here, but too, I want God to be, to bless you all beyond measure. I want you all to be experienced. I want you to literally, because the image that I get there from Malachi 3.10 is that you've got a cup, and God's got this giant, like, bucket that he's pouring out, and it fills your cup, and the blessings pour over, so in the process, you're just soaked. I want you all to be spiritually soaked by God's blessings. There, there is nothing that would bring me greater joy. That's why we see this topic in Scripture brought up. Some may argue over whether or not we must tithe. And I dare say that tithing is something we should all be doing. But it's just the starting point. That's just what is necessary to meet the needs. We ought to be seeking to get to a place where we not only are giving a certain percentage, but where we can give more. Because there's great joy in giving. And here's the thing. I, I challenge you to look at it this way. Don't look at your paycheck. Don't look at your checkbook balance. Get down on your hands and knees and say, Lord, show me what you have me give. Now be prepared. He may come back with a percentage or a number that you might say, Lord, how am I supposed to give that? Here's what you do then in response. You say, Lord, make it possible. Help me get to that place where I can get that going. Here, here's the crazy thing. We can actually ask God for help in every matter of life. Amen? He'll help us get there. And you know what's crazy? So many times I hear people say, it's like, man, I, I didn't understand this aspect of, of, my, of my Christian life. and I, I didn't understand what it was to be giving, but now I started trusting in God. And, and, and why didn't I do this sooner? where we get those phrases that you can't afford not to get to God. And as I've said too, though, this isn't all just about our money. It's about giving Him our heart. The following two verses here give us kind of closing. Verse 3, Paul says, When I arrive, whomever you may approve, I shall send them with letters to carry your gift to Jerusalem. Having the thought that there is protection in giving. And that protection goes two ways. If we're going to be honest, the protection is both for that we're giving unto the Lord because we want to give Him, we want to honor Him, we want to show Him we love Him. Because every single one of us want His protection, do we not? I don't know about you, but I need it every single day. I need every single moment. Why? Because I have a real enemy out in the world who's like a lion, Peter says, stalking me. He's hunting me. And he's looking for moments of weakness. If I'm going to be just transparent with you folks, over the last month or two, he's found some of my weaknesses. It's not so much that I'm coming before you to confess any major sin or anything. I'm just telling you. He's been busy. And while by God's grace, I don't necessarily have any sin to confess before you right now, I want to tell you, just because I didn't, wasn't successful in leading me into sin, it doesn't mean for one second that I didn't get bruised and battered along the way. We all do. We need God's protection. 
Furthermore, we need to be praying for our local church. Hey, boy, if there's anything that you can do for me above anything else in this world, the one thing I would covet from every single one of you more than anything is your prayers. Why? I need them. But two, both here at the church, Paul talks about this, you know, working with others, whomever you may approve. We need leaders to be raised up within the church who are going to handle the money that comes in and use it, disperse it from this church in a godly way. Do it in a way which is going to bring honor to him. That's why he says, choose men whom you may, whomever you may approve. You know, it is necessary for every church to entrust its property, its funds, into the hands of godly and responsible men. You know, the gifts of the early believers uh, were first entrusted to the apostles. But as their responsibilities grew, the apostles needed to be relieved of the job of dispersing funds for such things as feeding poor widows. And so in Acts 6 2, it says, The congregation of the disciples was then to, or Paul was saying, Select from among you, brethren, seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. The qualifications weren't financial or commercial, they were moral and spiritual ones. God's funds should be put in the hands of a church's most godly men, who will prayerfully and in the energy of the Holy Spirit supervise its use as priests who are presenting offerings unto the Lord then, on behalf of Israel. And with that being said, may I speak to you directly for a moment. The way we handle our money, we go through, we have a budget committee that meets in January, tries to set our budget, and then is presented to the deacon board who approves it, and then is presented to the church to vote upon. Well, first and foremost, people need to be involved. People need to be held accountable if there's anything that is so vital, it's transparency. But we live in a world today where, man, money doesn't get handled very well by certain people. But Lord, may that never be said of our church. May it always be said that we took the gifts that the Lord provided through our brothers and sisters in our church family and we used them for His glory and honor. That being said, we could use some more men to step up and be leaders. Now, unfortunately, as far as the role of deacon is concerned, we could use some more men who are willing to step up. Not just because we're, you know, we're trying to replace anybody who's there. It's more so that, you know, we, we've had two men here in this church that have faithfully served the Lord in that position. And they've been doing it for a while. I'm thankful for Troy and Jared as well. But you know, and it's not because, I don't say this to put Rich or Tom down, but you know, they've been serving the Lord in that position. We need some other men who are willing to step up and take that mantle as well. But according to the verse I just read, that means that a goal of being moral and spiritual so that you can be used by the Lord is essential. We need that. Church should not be a place where 10% of the people do all the work. Many hands make like the work. We need more men who are willing to step up, do what the Lord asks. Now, unfortunately, there are some qualifications that do limit who can be a deacon. But we also have a trustee board. Maybe there's other ways. I'm going to tell you right now, there is a place for every single one of you to be serving the Lord here in this church. Whether it's a small role or a big role. But we all need to. We all need to make sure that we're doing because we want God's protection so that he doesn't come down upon us because we've used the things he's blessed us with in a bad way. Now that leads us to our last point. I'm going to close with this. What is your perspective of giving? What is your perspective of giving? Verse 4 says, and if it's fitting for me to go also, they will go with me. Now Paul is traveling here. He had mentioned that collection. He says, look, if it's fitting, I'll take the offering to Jerusalem. If that means that you guys are so busy serving the Lord here that it'd be more convenient for you just to let me take the offering and I'll take it with so that way you can keep serving the Lord here. Giving your all to him. 
things mm -hmm. encouraging the Corinthians, keep giving from that joyful, willful heart. The Lord loves a cheerful giver. Did you know that God made all of his creation to give? See, what are you talking about? Yeah, I know there's going to be some of you that will raise your hand for this. How many of you love it when it's a nice, warm, sunny day? Come on, Miss Judy. I know that's one of you. I know at least you. I'm depending on you. I say that for this purpose. What's one of the nice things when you go outside and that sun is shining? What is it giving us? It's giving us warmth. It's giving us light. How about the clouds? If I'm going to be honest, <laughs> last week, I had a good time fellowshipping with everybody, but a few clouds would have been a little nice. Because, man, that sun... Our, our white tables felt like they turned into mirrors because that sun was just hitting down and it was bouncing right back off. So maybe next year, if we know it's going to be a sunny day like that, maybe we'll get some black tablecloths and just let everybody know it's not a funeral. It's just to counteract the bright sun that's coming down. Sometimes a cloud comes along and gives us some shade. I know there's some hot days, especially for those of you who've ever had jobs that you work outside, do a lot of work outside, and that sun's coming along, and every so often a cloud comes along and just gives you that little bit of brief respite from the hot or the heat that's outside. You're like, okay, Lord, just stop that cloud right there for the next half hour, hour, whatever it is, while I'm doing what I'm doing. Why? Is that cloud giving me shit? How about when that, th when that same cloud turns dark, but then it gives rain? that the earth needs, and our plants need. Oh, wait a minute. The earth that then gives us those plants back as forms of food, or medicine, or other things, building materials, whatever it may be. God has made all of his creation to give. And we're supposed to be the apple of God's eye in creation, right? We're supposed to be the prize of his creation. And you know what the sad thing is? Fallen man is the most reluctant giver of all of God's creations. One of the surest signs of a recreated new man in Jesus Christ, one who's been saved and redeemed, is a willingness to give to his Savior. Everything. An Athenian statesman who lived shortly after this time, his name was Aristides, and he wrote this about Christians in the second century. He said, they walk in humility and kindness, and falsehood is not found among them. They love one another. They despise not the widow, and they grieve not the orphan. He that hath distributes liberally to him that hath not. If they see a stranger, they bring him under their roof, and they rejoice over him as if he were their brother. For they call themselves brethren, not after the flesh, but after the spirit and in God. But when one of their poor passes away from the world, and any of them see him, then he provides for his burial according to his ability. And if they hear that any of their numbers are in prison or oppressed for the name of their Messiah, all of them provide for his needs. And if it's possible that he may be delivered, they deliver him. And if there's among them a man that is poor and needy, and they have not an abundance of necessity, they will fast two or three days so that they may supply the needy with his necessary food. Does that describe you? Oh, let, me, let me turn that around. Because I'll ask the, set, the question not just to, my, to you, but to myself. Does it describe me? It should. You know, my hope and plan is that after we wrap up our study here in 1 Corinthians, we're going to take a look at the book of Philemon. One of the most important principles that's taught in that book is about forgiveness. You know what? Where do you find right in the smack middle of forgiveness? Give. When we talk about forgiveness, Jesus tells us to forgive. Why? Because we've been forgiven much. He wants us to give because we've been given much. 1 John 3.17 says, Whoever has the world's goods and beholds his brother in need and closes his heart against him, how does the love of God abide in him? The title of this message was All Giving. That means we're all to be giving and that we're all to be giving our all. Now, those are easier words to say than they are to practice. But if we aren't practicing them, are we truly trusting His provision and sufficiency in our lives? Let's pray. 
Father, as we come before you this morning, but we can't help but stop and praise you, Lord, for your continued loving hand upon our lives. Lord, you've blessed us so much. Father, I pray that we always take time, we set aside time to praise you and thank you for how you've blessed us. Lord, I pray that you would guard our hearts and protect them in such a way that we would always have that desire to give you all. You've given us so much. And you keep giving to us every single day. May we give all to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's close by singing Trust and Obey. <laughs>